context of this seminar, I'm going to make a series of preliminary statements prior to the official start, if you want to call it that. I'm going to start out with a first preliminary statement, a quote from the first chapter of my new book, which will be entitled Mind and Body. The first chapter, in fact, is entitled The Mind, Check Your Premises. I quote myself here. The first chapter of my last book, the new revised heavy duty book, is entitled Bodybuilders Are Confused. Are they confused? Almost without exception, the individuals that I've spoken with or observed firsthand are impotently bewildered, literally almost paralyzed by self-doubt, which in this context is characterized by an ongoing inability to arrive at a firm conclusion as how to proceed with their training. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the result of their ignorance of the nature and value of fundamental principles and the role they play in guiding one's thinking as well as his training. I want to tell you right now that this is going to be a different bodybuilding seminar than any of you may have ever attended. I refuse to stand up here and speak to you like your retarded children who so lack intellectual depth you can't exert the mental effort or focus required to integrate higher level knowledge. Like so many, who, like so many others who do seminars, I won't insult your intelligence by expecting you to accept anything I have to say just because I'm Mike Messer. <clears throat> Nor will I, of course, bore you with the same intellectual pattern, or more precisely, garbage you've read about and heard about so often before. They say, do four sets of this, do five sets of that, train two days on, one day off, train three days on, one day off, and then not provide you with the reasons. I, myself, as a man of reason, will only act on the basis of understanding the reasons for doing something at all, as all mature adults should. No, my seminar material is not infinitely complex either, but it is not pablum. There really is this thing, a viable intellectual discipline, called exercise science. And while, of course, you don't have to be a full-fledged exercise scientist or a PhD in physiology to be a successful bodybuilder, Obviously, it would be to your decided advantage to have at least a firm understanding of the fundamental principles of bodybuilding science, which is known more technically, bodybuilding science, is really technically, scientifically referred to as high-intensity anaerobic exercise stress physiology. That's right, the term high-intensity is not something I or Arthur Jones cooked up to sound pretentious or falsely technical. Bodybuilding science is really, actually, the science, once again, of high intensity anaerobic exercise stress physiology. And again, I promise you, if you're willing to put all else aside in your mind right now, truly listen, focus intensely, you'll leave here today with the attitude, ah, now I see clearly what this endeavor is really all about. I presume, after all, you came here because of a passionate desire to be a successful bodybuilder, whether to fulfill your muscular potential for personal reasons, to be Mr. New England, or even Mr. Olympia. Have you given any thought at all to why Dorian Yates is so great? Of course, many might say he has great genetics. That's true. What makes Dorian Yates different is that he was willing to read my articles and books ten years ago when I was his idol and practice heavy-duty, high-intensity training. And that's the truth. This is not something he just picked up a few years ago. Ten years ago when he began training, I was his hero or something, and he decided to do what Mike Messer did. He read my books and articles. The theory of high-intensity training, however, is not true because Mike Messer or Dorian Yates says so. It doesn't matter who says so. It's true not because I say it's true, it's true because the logic of the theory is unassailable, just like the theory that two and two is four. Considering your intense desire over the months and years, perhaps in many cases, to be a successful bodybuilder, I'm asking you today, why not get intense mentally, truly intense with your focus, with me here today, and finally, finally learn once and for all, clear up the confusion, 
come to gain a precise understanding of the actual nature of body doing science. Make sense? Finally get, get this thing straight. Are we in agreement? Okay. But now let's master the fundamental principles of bodybuilding science so that when you go to work out, you'll know why you're doing what you're doing. You'll stop being confused, uncertain. By knowing why you're doing what you're doing, of course, you'll be more confident. And by being more confident, of course, there you'll be also more motivated. And motivation, as you know, is a key element of human psychology necessary to achieve all goals and also live a meaningful, happy life. He who is not motivated is not very happy, is he? And there's no, there's no mystery about the nature of motivation. Motivation comes from your intellectual confidence, your knowledge. If you're not very certain about something, you're not going to be moved or motivated to go out and try to get it, are you? And big muscles alone won't make you confident or happy or motivated. Knowing, once again, knowledge, knowledge is what makes a man confident. And as wonderful as bigger muscles or more money are, and that, that's true, they are wonderful. Think for a moment. Look inside yourself. As much as you may want big muscles, more money, what is it that we all respect and want the most? Without a doubt, confidence. comments over it. This is the official portion, if you will, entitled, the seminar is going to be entitled Mind and Body. As much as this talk, ladies and gentlemen, is about, is about the improvement of the human body and its ability to perform optimally, it's also about the mind, since human intelligence, of course, is what makes it possible to understand anything at all, including exercise science, and that which, of course, is most interesting to all of us here, and that, of course, is us. We, the member of the species man, the highest of all living species on Earth. When I was 12 years old, I decided I was going to be Mr. Universe someday. That's right, I didn't say I merely wanted to be or hoped to be. My desire was so deep and truly earnest, I said to myself, I'm going to be Mr. Universe. That's all there is to it. From that moment on, I spent literally every day of the ensuing 16 years avidly seeking to gain the knowledge required to become a bodybuilding champion. At the age of 28, in 1978, I finally achieved that goal and won the world's bodybuilding championship, better known as Mr. Universe, with the only perfect score in history. Afterwards, however, my quest for knowledge of the human body and exercise continued unabated because even though I won the title, I knew there was a lot more knowledge out there. My new goal at that point was to master the science of exercise. And here today, 14 years later, at the age of 43, I can proudly state I've achieved that goal as well. I have literally mastered the science of exercise. That is not to say I'm God, or that I have even an exhaustive knowledge of the subject. And while such may be possible, while it's possible to achieve an exhaustive knowledge of the subject of exercise science, it is not necessary in my field today, I'm a professional bodybuilding and fitness trainer, to be as successful in that field or any field, truly successful, one must of course gain a thorough understanding of the fundamental ideas or principles which form the foundation of knowledge in that field. In order to achieve total mastery of my field of endeavor, I set about six years ago to gain a comprehensive understanding of philosophy, logic, and the nature of knowledge. Philosophy, by the way, means literally love of knowledge. The very concept of philosophy was first discovered by one of the greatest men in human history by the name of Plato, who lived in the age of classical Greece 23 centuries ago. Plato was the first man to understand that the human mind has a specific nature just like the body does, and that the human mind requires a specific method of thought 
to gain valid knowledge or true ideas. And as a sincere bodybuilder, you should want to know, people, that the ideas guiding you constitute true ideas. If not, then you're, you're literally lacking self-esteem. You're leaving your life to change. Plato was a teacher as well as a philosopher. His best student was an even greater man named Aristotle. In fact, Aristotle was the greatest man who ever lived as he was responsible, literally responsible, for discovering the greatest of all discoveries of human history, the laws of logic, the principles of human thought, and for those scientists, as you know, the scientific method. As you may have learned in history class somewhere along the line, the thought and teachings of Aristotle and the ancient Greeks literally established our Western civilization, the context within which it was possible for science, medicine, art, morality, and justice to flourish. Now back to the mind and the body. The mind's role in building a body, not just the muscular physical body, but a body of knowledge as well. Isn't that what you're here for today? Remember, this is not going to be intellectual pattern, but it's not infinitely complex either. What you're here for, explicitly, your explicit purpose is to gain knowledge. I want to teach you just ever so briefly something about the nature of knowledge itself. Knowledge, once again, like the body and everything else that exists, has a nature. Your body has a nature. You have cells, organs, appendages. Knowledge, too, has a nature, an identity, or a structure, if you will. All knowledge is, what, is what's called hierarchical in structure. Hierarchical in structure. The word or concept hierarchical comes from the word hierarchy, which means literally sacred structure. A hierarchy has a foundation or a base, like a house does, consisting, in, in this case with knowledge, of fundamentals. The foundation of knowledge is your fundamentals. Remember in basketball, or football, or no matter what you did in school, the coaches taught you, let's, let's learn the fundamentals first, remember that? Well, knowledge has a fundamental base too. A hierarchy, again, has a foundation or base consisting of fundamental ideas. On top of the foundation, or the fundamentals, are more complex ideas, called derivatives. The derivatives are based on and derived from an understanding of the fundamentals. Derived, therefore called derivative. This once again is true of all knowledge, whether in mathematics, philosophy, medicine, business, plumbing, or exercise science. The easiest place to see and understand this concept of hierarchical knowledge is in mathematics. What are the fundamentals? Addition subtraction, multiplication, and division. And of course, it is only on this base, or on the basis of understanding the fundamentals, that one may move up the hierarchy in logical progression to more complex derivative knowledge, such as algebra and calculus. As I said earlier, there really is such a thing as exercise science. Although you wonder when you read the muscle magazines, and again, while you don't have to be a PhD in exercise physiology, obviously it would behoove you to gain at least a firm understanding of the simple fundamentals. That's all this is going to be today. Nothing extremely complex. Let's go to the field of exercise science, in fact. Just as knowledge in the fields of mathematics and philosophy has a structure, so does that context of knowledge which constitutes exercise science. The most basic or fundamental distinction in exercise science is the one delimiting aerobic exercise as a branch separate from anaerobic exercise. And that's true. If you were to go to, to school to formally study exercise science or physiology, the very first thing they would teach you literally is that the field of exercise science is broken up into two fundamental pieces, aerobic exercise and anaerobic Aerobic exercise, as you well know, is of a low intensity nature and is geared exclusively to the development of endurance of a certain type. Aerobic literally means with oxygen and is defined scientifically as low intensity, long duration exercise. Low intensity, long duration. 
that means carry out for long periods. Because remember, the purpose of aerobics is to what? Build endurance, which means your capacity for performing more and more work. So it's low intensity, long duration. Anaerobic activity, however, is an entirely different species of exercise, one that is geared exclusively, specifically to the development of strength, muscular size, and speed, and involves a different metabolic pathway, one that utilizes glycogen almost exclusively as its energy substrate, if you will. Anaerobic means literally without oxygen, and is defined scientifically, it's just the opposite of aerobic. It's defined scientifically as high intensity, short duration exercise. High intensity, short duration exercise. My point earlier was that the term high intensity training, the term high intensity was not something Arthur Jones or myself cooked up to sound pretentious or falsely technical. This high intensity anaerobic exercise is the science of bodybuilding exercise, not because I say so, it's just the way it is. The fundamental character of man's physiology, along with the specific nature of anaerobic metabolism, dictates what specific training causes must be enacted to affect the development of strength and muscular size beyond normal levels. Or in other words, reality and its laws, the laws of nature, determine how you must train. It has nothing to do with your wishes or whims or the intellectual vomit you read in the muscle magazines. The specific actions required must be taken by any and all who truly desire stronger and larger muscles, whether they are cognizant of such or not, whether they like it or not. Again, we have this thing called reality and its laws, the laws of nature. You will not develop a very good suntan sitting in front of a 100 watt light bulb. I don't care how much phosphagene suntan lotion you rub into your belly button. Nature requires the presence of a high intensity sunlight stress. While the fields of aerobic exercise and anaerobic exercise have nothing in common in practice, scientifically, intellectually, the one element they do obviously possess together is the concept intensity. As I stated above, aerobic activity is low intensity, long duration, while anaerobic bodybuilding activity is high intensity, short duration. The concept or principle of intensity I submit is literally the foundation or the most fundamentally important principle in all of exercise science. Again, it's not something I made up. It doesn't matter how many lug heads with 25 inch arms say I'm crazy or high intensity doesn't work. It doesn't matter how many Knuckleheads would say two and two is five, but still four. I don't care how big their arm is or how small their brain, two and two is four. <laughs> the concept intensity, again, is the foundation or most fundamentally important principle of exercise science, and it is only on the basis of understanding the term intensity that one may define either aerobic or anaerobic. anaerobic. Remember, one is low intensity, one is high intensity. This is the most important principle of all of exercise science. But so you see where this is the proper place to start to learn something truly meaningful about exercise. Very often I have a new phone consultation client say to me, Mike, you don't have to lecture me on your training theory because I've read all of your books and articles. So don't lecture me on theory. I already know that stuff. Then I ask them, okay, if you're so conversant with my ideas, the science of exercise, tell me off the top of your head, John or George or whoever it is, tell me off the top of your head what the precise definition of intensity is. And in three years, not a single one of those individuals who claim to have knowledge of this could even define the most basic or fundamentally important principle of exercise science. Therefore, they don't have any slightest clue as to what they're doing. And to me, it seems almost ludicrous to be spending one, two, five, ten years of your life trying to do something without making the slightest bit of mental effort to gain the most simple knowledge. 
Lefty, you should be spanked for it. <laughs> so the concept here, the principle is intensity. Intensity. When an athlete or a bodybuilder goes to the gym to work out, his or her goal, of course, is to build bigger muscles. Do you see, therefore, ladies and gentlemen, that there has to be something about the workout itself? You're in the gym. We know you have to lift weights, right? I mean, there's one bit of logic nobody can escape. We all know you have to lift weights. Do you see where there has to be some one element, therefore, some factor, some variable within the workout itself, which is responsible for inducing growth stimulation, for causing the muscle to start to grow, in other words? It is only within the context of understanding what this variable is that a bodybuilder can intelligently do the type of training necessary to cause growth stimulation. If you don't know what intensity is, then you don't know how to work out, in other words. And how can you justify spending even one more day or month going to the gym confused and uncertain? How many of you, having heard that little introductory piece where I described the title of my first book, Bodybuilders Are Confused? How many of you in here have never been confused about bodybuilding? Okay. I said there has to be something about the workout itself. There has to be some element, some variable about the workout itself, which itself is responsible for triggering or flipping on the growth machinery inside the muscle. And of course, it is related to the intensity of effort involved with any given set of an exercise. Now, I'm not going to ask you people to write down much, and of course you're free. We still live in a semi-free country. You don't have to write down anything at all. But if you are going to follow me here today, if you're going to get intense mentally, as I suggested earlier, I would strongly advise you to write down the, the proper, valid, scientific definition of intensity, which I'm going to give you in a moment. Get your pens poised and ready. If you want to understand anything truly meaningful about exercise, this thing we all love, then you have to understand this next statement. You ready? Properly defined. Intensity. Properly defined. I'll speak slowly and I'll repeat myself because this is the most important point today in a fundamental sense. Properly defined, intensity refers to the percentage of possible momentary muscular effort being exerted. Properly defined, intensity refers to the percentage of possible momentary muscular effort being exerted. Does anyone require that I state that again? Got it? Now, since the definition I just gave you is rather abstract or technical, in fact, when I first read that definition, I didn't have the slightest clue. What the hell does that mean, I thought. Now I do understand it perfectly. The best way to clarify a highly abstract or technical definition is to go to a concrete example in perceptual reality. You, like any healthy, well-conditioned person, are capable of exerting yourself with a maximum effort at any given moment. What I'm going to do, what I'm going to do here is carefully explain intensity. This may seem slow for two minutes, but then we'll, we'll move more briskly ahead. If you were to look outside right now, any one of you, and you saw a loved one pinned under the front wheel of an automobile without a second thought or need of a warm-up, you've heard these stories. If you saw one of your loved ones pinned under the front wheel of a car, you'd run out there, and in the attempt to lift the car off that person, you would exert yourself with 100% of your possible momentary muscular effort. Now let's plug in the word for the definition you would exert yourself with 100% intensity of effort. Let's assume hypothetically that you, the listener today, could curl a 100-pound barbell for a maximum of 10 reps to failure, such that you couldn't possibly do an 11th rep. Now, the first rep of that set, of course, would be very easy. It would be the easiest, in fact, of all the reps of the set. Of all the reps of the set, in other words, 
first rep would require the least percentage of your possible momentary muscular effort, the least intensity of effort. The first repetition fatigues you a little bit, of course, and therefore the second rep would require a greater effort, whereas the first rep may require 8 to 12 percent intensity of effort, 8 to 12 percent of your possible momentary muscular effort. The second rep may require on the order of 20 percent. The second rep fatigues you even more, and the third rep will be experienced by you as harder still. And so it goes with each successive rep of the set. Each one is harder than the last. Each one requires a higher percentage of your possible momentary muscular effort than did the preceding until finally we get to that last rep, the tenth one, where you're trying as hard as you can. That last rep is very special in that it's the only rep of the set that requires 100% intensity of effort, 100% of your possible momentary muscular ability. Now let me ask you a question. If you could throw 100 pounds for 10 reps and you literally only ever did one rep, the first rep, and put the bar back down on the floor every time, never attempting any more than that, do you think you would ever grow? No. Why not? Because the intensity of the stress would be too low, not threatening enough to the body's physiology to cause an adaptive response, i.e. a strength in muscular size increase. Do you see also, ladies and gentlemen, where it would stand to reason that the last rep would also be better than the second rep? If you could curl 100 pounds for 10 reps to failure and you did two reps, do you think you would get anything out of it? or three reps or four. Of course not, that last rep is very, very special. There is something that goes on physiologically on that last rep in the set where maximum intensity is required, which is literally responsible for flipping on the growth machinery inside the muscle. Do you see why it's so very crucially important you understand that? If you don't know, understand the principle of intensity, you don't know how to guide your training efforts. Again, this is the most fundamentally important principle in exercise science. The next issue we'll be dealing with, going beyond intensity, is how much of it do you need? See, first you have to establish what is the training stress. What is it? What is that one variable about the workout which itself flips on the growth machinery? Then you have to ask yourself the question, how many sets and how often? The issues of volume and frequency. Now here's an important concluding point before we move on a little more resolutely perhaps. Once you have stimulated growth by going to failure, you don't have to do it again. It's like when you throw the switch to turn on a light. Once you've thrown the switch, you're confident that the electrical mechanism is in motion. You don't stand there all day flipping the switch up and down, do you? Now remember how I started this. I said there has to be something about the workout, some variable. What is it about bodybuilding, weight training, that makes the muscle grow? Is it the number of sets? Is it the position of the moon? Is it the number of beautiful girls in thong bikinis tantalizing you while you're doing your curls? What is it? There has to be something. It's the last rep of a set carried to failure. What else could it be? Remember, bodybuilding is not aerobics. It's not endurance training. A bodybuilding workout is not an endurance contest. The idea is to go into the gym and do what nature requires to stimulate growth, then you get the hell out of the gym, go home and do something meaningful, like make love to your girlfriend, instead of hanging around the gym, hearing the same stale, dirty jokes over and over and all that stuff. Do you see my point? That last rep of a set carry to failure is the trigger that flips on the growth machinery. And once you've done that, you don't have to do it again. Why? Because you already flipped on the machinery. If you don't know that, you will always be tempted to do a second set. And then you'll, if you don't know it there, you'll say, geez, I'm so confused. Maybe I should do a third set. 
Well, gee, I'm still uncertain. I don't know what the hell makes my muscles grow. I better do a four set. You'll resort to that childlike notion, well, if five jelly beans are better than one, then five sets have to be better than one set. That's real scientific. You can't take a principle from childhood, more jelly beans are better than less, and apply it to adult life in bodybuilding science and expect to achieve optimal results or any results at all. In fact, if you look back to your childhood, you realize you were wrong there. More jelly beans ain't better than less. After a certain point, you get sick, your teeth fall out, and you get fat. <laughs> any questions on that issue? A lot of my clients say, Mike, why don't more bodybuilders embrace what you're trying to say? And I said, well, number one, I'm not trying to say anything. I'm succeeding at it. The ones with any gray cells, with any brains at all, you know, just a little bit more than none, and truly care, will listen. Uh, you may recall on the poster, or if you received a flyer, there, there was a short little story on there about a, a smart aleck, what a nice kid, I'm just teasing, named Rico McClinton. He, like many other people, refused, or not refused, well, yes, in one sense refused, because they had not taken the time to sit down and consider the nature of one actual set to failure, as I just explained to you from the first rep to the tenth, they, they're so obsessed with the idea number one. In fact, there used to be a song years ago, number one is the loneliest number one. They just can't believe that one set of high intensity exercise to failure could possibly be enough. Several weeks ago, actually it's been a few months ago, Rico McClinton, who is Flex Wheeler's training partner, and a nice guy, but a teaser, a bit of a smart, smart aleck, in front of a whole group of people, he yelled out, Mike Messer, do you still believe that crap? That one set to failure is all that's required to stimulate muscle growth. And I replied, Rico, it only took one sperm from your daddy to stimulate the growth of your mother's egg into a whole human baby. Not just stimulate muscle growth, but teeth, hair, and bone growth. But in your case, Rico, there was no brain growth. <laughs> and he, he took it in the way it was intended. He didn't punch me out. Why can't one set be it? If it's not one set, ladies and gentlemen, then precisely how many sets is it? And that is the issue here. If you're, if you're convinced that I'm wrong, it can't be one set, then do you see where it's your intellectual responsibility to tell all of us here today precisely what is enough? Because that's the issue. What is enough? How many sets do you need? I said to some people in the gym who were contesting my ideas, well, if I'm wrong then, John, or whoever, you tell us here how many sets are precisely enough, scientifically. It only takes one bullet to kill you. It only takes one sperm to stimulate the growth of an ovum into a zygote and then a full human being. Why can't one set be enough? If you don't like the idea number one, let's call it a hundred zillion units of intensity. See my point? In fact, this was something I didn't clarify fully in my last book, which was responsible for considerable confusion. It resulted in people's failure to grasp the essence of the cardinal or fundamental principle of the theory, which is only one set of an exercise carried to failure is all that is required to stimulate an optimal increase in strength and muscular size. Lacking a grasp of this issue inevitably leads to the commitment of a number of grave training mistakes. Mistakes that will seriously compromise progress short of optimum. I noticed, for instance, that many of my phone consultation clients would call back for a first follow-up call to report on their progress, and they would say something to the effect, well, gee, Mike, I like the intense short workouts, but I often felt, they used the word felt, always the word feel, I felt, Mike, like I should have done one or two more sets than the one set you prescribed. Based on their feeling, they performed the additional set or two. And I would respond by informing them that the feeling they were experiencing was in fact fear. Specifically a fear that they hadn't done enough to achieve the goal of stimulating growth. I finally realized that the fault was mine and that I had failed to adequately emphasize this fact. The fact that the last rep 
is the rep that causes the growth machinery to go into motion. In other cases, phone consultation clients were calling back to report that they had added drop sets as a means of increasing intensity, something I had not advised them to do. With drop sets, as you may well know, the trainee performs a conventional high intensity set to failure, whereupon he immediately removes or drops an arbitrary amount of weight from the bar machine, then immediately goes back to perform the same exercise to failure once again, repeating the drop process as many as two or three times. This is a grave mistake. This is not a method of intensifying the effort, but of extending the effort. Therefore, it is more of an endurance training technique. Since the trainee already flipped on the growth machinery by going to momentary muscular failure once, any more exercise after that is not just wasted effort, it is counterproductive. Any exercise carried on beyond what is required to achieve the goal of flipping on the growth machinery is precisely what constitutes overtraining. What is overtraining? You've all used the term. How many times have you used the term or heard the term overtraining? Of course, you've stopped counting. And you all know that overtraining means something kind of sort of negative. It's the worst mistake you can make. Overtraining is precisely what keeps you from growing. Although people seek to develop larger muscles and obtain a suntan for cosmetic reasons, in other words, to improve their appearance, nature evolved these capacities as adaptive responses to intense physical stresses. The buildup of muscles or melanin skin pigment beyond normal levels represent defensive barriers against future assaults from high intensity physical stress namely anaerobic bodybuilding and ultraviolet sunlight stress. In the late 1800s, the famous French physiologist Claude Bernard stated that the ability of living organisms to maintain the constancy, constancy of their internal physiologic milieu or environment despite changes in the external environment is their most salient physical characteristic. For example, an individual exposed to fluctuations in atmospheric temperatures doesn't experience much, if any, of a change in body temperature unless, of course, he's thrown into the fire or stuck into the polar ice cap. An individual can also eat large quantities of a particular food substance without fearing the altering of, his composition, of the composition of his blood. The capacity to maintain a constant internal environment as you may have learned in college or high school biology, is known as homeostasis, which means to keep a similar position. The body, however, is very economical with its reserve of adaptive resources and will not disrupt its homeostatic balance by using these resources unless there is sufficient reason to do so. And only a high intensity stress is sufficiently threatening to the body's re reserve of resources that it will defend itself by developing an adaptive barrier. In other words, if you were to continue to go out into the August sunlight and your body didn't develop that defensive barrier known as a suntan, it would kill you. Your inner tissues would literally be cooked while you were alive. The adaptive process, therefore, is essentially defensive in nature. It, and the degree to which an adaptive response is stimulated is directly proportional to the intensity of the stressor. Again, you can sit in front of a 100 watt light bulb for an infinity of eternities, you're never going to get a suntan because the intensity of the light stress is not threatening your body enough to cause a, an adaptive response, the building of a defensive barrier, a suntan. Remember, the degree to which your adaptive response, whether it's a muscle buildup or a suntan buildup, the degree of your adaptive response is directly proportional to the intensity of the stress. And it's an either or situation. Either the intensity of the stress is high enough or it's not. Like Arthur Jones years ago liked to do, he would liken building 
muscles with barbells to exploding a piece of dynamite with a hammer. He would say, Mike Messer, it only requires one well-placed blow from a hammer to stimulate a piece of dynamite to explode. Any number of lighter blows will not do the trick. Same thing in bodybuilding. Nature. Reality is lost. The laws of nature require that you impose a high intensity training stress on your delicate physiology to threaten it enough so the body adapts by getting bigger muscles. And if you don't want to go to failure, you can't make up for it by doing a number of candy ass, mandy pandy lighter sets. Let's say that each and every one of you in here was just as avid a sun tanner as you are a bodybuilder. In other words, your desire for achieving the greatest suntan possible is just as great as your desire to build big muscles. And given your, your earnest desire, every summer you move to Africa at the equator because that's where, of course, the intensity. You see how the term intensity really is used scientifically here. You have high intensity sunlight, high intensity radio waves. You would move, in your desire to get a great suntan, you move to the equator every summer, knowing, not fretting even slightly, there would be no slightest concern that by the end of the summer, you would have a great suntan now with there. Right? Why? Because the intensity of the ultraviolet sunlight stress at the equator is considerably greater than anywhere else in the world. So, not only would you not fret about obtaining the best suntan possible by the end of the summer, you would not fret either that the intensity, that the intensity of the physical stress was high enough to cause an adaptive response, i.e. a suntan buildup. What would be your overwhelming concern? Not the intensity. Not getting burnt. Not overexposing yourself to the stress. Not the intensity, but you would have no slightest concern that the intensity of the stress was sufficiently high to stimulate that adaptive response we know as a suntan buildup. You would have one overweening, one overwhelming concern, and that would be to precisely regulate the volume and frequency of the exposure. Any more than that is overdosing on the stress. A sunburn. When do you get a better suntan? In January or August? Why? Because the intensity of the physical stress is much greater. In January, you can expose your skin for several hours to the sunlight. You won't get a sunburn, but you won't get a suntan either. January sunlight is more like aerobic, low intensity, long duration. You can do aerobics for a long time. You won't build big muscles, but you won't get a, you won't overtrain either. Now, in August, when the intensity of the sunlight is very high, you will obtain a suntan without a doubt. But what happens when you expose your skin for even one minute longer than is precisely required by nature? You burn. What do you think might happen, ladies and gentlemen, if you were to perform one set more of high intensity anaerobic bodybuilding stress than is required by nature? Overtraining is the equivalent of an exercise sunburn. Overtraining, in other words, is not something kind of, sort of negative. It's the worst training mistake you can make. I have a, a short piece here. What's possible with high intensity training? What possible results can I get? Well, you can always cite certain specific individuals as examples, of course. Mike Menser, Ray Menser, Casey Beater, Aaron Baker, David Durth, David Paul, and last but not least, the greatest and the most gracious of all, Dorian Yates, who's been very kind to give me some credit. You may have heard of David Paul, one of the famous Barbarian brothers. A couple years ago, he approached me in Gold's Gym in Venice, California, complaining he had not gained anything at all in strength or size for five years and I said David it took you that long to realize something was not right just joking he had in fact been training two times a day for up to three to four hours a day every day for five years he was mistakenly doing 
aerobic endurance training with, with weights, and that's the worst thing you can do. Remember, bodybuilding is not aerobics. It's not low intensity, long duration. You're not looking to build endurance. You're looking to build strength and muscular size. Bodybuilding is anaerobic, high intensity, short duration. Anyway, in one month under my personal supervision, David gained 7 to 10 pounds of muscle and improved his squats by 185 pounds. On March 1st of 1995, a young man from France by the name of Frederick Munte came to Gold's Gym in Venice for one month for the exclusive purpose of my training him. The first day in the gym, he said, Mike, what do you realistically think I could gain with heavy duty training in one month? I said, realistically, eight or nine pounds. I put him on the scale that first day, he was 174 pounds. When he left on April 1st, Frederick weighed 193 pounds. He gained 19 pounds of lean muscle. And I say lean muscle because you might be wondering, well, maybe 18 pounds was fat. Well, he was rather rangy, you know, tall, linear, thin skin to begin with. And the last day when we checked out his skin thickness, he and I were convinced that if there was any fat, we couldn't see it. On August 1st of 1995, Another gentleman by the name of Will Nasser came to, to me in Venice, all the way from Egypt, believe it or not, again for the exclusive purpose of having me train him, personally supervise his workouts for one month. In that period of time, he gained 16 pounds and tripled the functional ability of his legs by 300%. His first leg workout, Will performed 11 reps with 250 pounds on a Nautilus leg extension. On August the 28th, he performed 35 reps. He tripled the functional ability of his legs in one month, something that very few bodybuilders do in a lifetime. Now some people say, Mentor, that's not possible. That's really, you're just saying that to stretch the truth, to sound like you're cool and sell some books or something. <laughs> I say, well, don't forget it was only 50 years ago that they said it was impossible to go to the moon. Of course, if you know literally nothing about the scientific principles of astrophysics, you look, at, you look up at that moon, you say, there ain't no way we're going there. If you know nothing about the scientific principles of high-intensity anaerobic bodybuilding, of course it seems impossible. If you're still operating on the childlike fuzzy notion, more is better. More jelly beans are better than less, so more sets and allow your workout to degenerate unwittingly into an endurance contest, of course you're never going to grow. You keep sunburning yourself. Christ, a dog knows better. Get out of the rain. This is a letter. This is about a letter, or includes the letter I got from an individual uh, and my answer. The name of the article or the column, I should say, the question and answer column is A Blind Leap Into the Dark. Subtitled, When You're Looking for the Truth, Expect the Unexpected. This is the question. Dear Mike, I have tried every program, routine, method, or whatever since I started training two years ago. Everything from the extreme volume approach, training six times a week, twice a day, to the hard gainers program, which involved only three times a week for one hour per session. Nothing worked. Talk about frustrated. I read about your heavy duty training system in Dorian Yates' book, Blood and Guts. But when I asked one of the guys in the gym what heavy duty was about, he said you recommended very short workouts of only about 20 minutes each twice a week. I thought about trying your heavy duty system, Mr. Mincer, but it seemed so radical. I don't know what the hell to do. Any advice would be appreciated. And this is part of my answer. <laughs> Most bodybuilders, Kevin, regard bodybuilding, in fact, as an avocation or hobby. As such, many make the mistake of not taking it seriously enough. They forget that bodybuilding is a part of this thing called exercise science, you know? Exercise science is part of medical science, and both, of course, are based on an understanding of the principles of human physiology, which means they apply to all of us, unless you're not human. 
while it is not necessary of course that one be a full fledged exercise scientist to be a good body builder a solid understanding of the fundamental principles of productive body and body building exercise would certainly help your approach from the start Kevin amounts to nothing more than a blind leap into the dark literally a blind leap into the dark throughout life you will encounter innumerable ideas or theories on every subject in human life from religion to philosophy politics the healing arts nutrition and of course bodybuilding exercise as well etc like so many people in our culture you were never taught to think or judge critically as a result you're often bewildered or confused when confronted with the necessity of making intellectual choices such as which training theory to employ. I was somewhat like this when I was in my late teens also. I used to operate on the idea that if something was printed, it had to be true. Later, of course, I came to understand that my notion was illogical. Of course, not every idea can be true since so many of them conflict with and contradict the other ideas. And yes, Kevin, heavy duty is radical, as you said in your letter. Most truths, upon initial discovery, stand out as something radical. But don't forget, nothing else you tried worked. So when looking for the truth, expect the unexpected. Make sense?